So we're great, glad to see you this morning. Today we're going to talk about facing uncertainty. And I don't know about you, there's been a lot of uncertainty lately. Would you agree? And differing opinions on everything, on everything, and including your life. And so here's the question I have for you. If you're going through uncertainty right now, how are you dealing with it? Are you just venting? That seemed to help. Are you just venty? Does that seem to help? That was a Starbucks joke. Thanks for getting it. Michelle, see, Michelle laughs at all my jokes. So I want to tell you a little story about a little uncertainty. Years ago, um, by the way, I was not a football player. I know you can probably tell. Um, but uh, I did run track, and I was in band, and so I was a Band-Aid. And um, so, but every year, the... Thanks. But every year, the, the high school would pit the guys uh, who didn't play football against other guys who didn't play football. And some of the players were football players and some weren't. But every year, we had a flag football game. Sophomores would take on freshmen and juniors would take on ju uh, seniors. So when I was a junior, they decided that it would be a good idea for me to play. Either that or they were just out of people. And so they put me... Uh, on the line. Now, I was really fast. I know that's hard to believe, too, but I was actually the fastest student in my school, so don't ask me why they put me on the line. I weighed about 120 pounds at that time, maybe 130, and they put me on the front line against a senior who was a, a little over six foot tall and probably doubled my weight. And uh, I played defense and offense uh, right in the line, and so on offense, I was to try to of course, get their quarterback. And on defense, I was trying to keep our quarterback from getting killed. Well, I didn't really know how to play football. And this guy apparently had played dirty football. So I don't know how many times I was elbowed in the head and shoved in the face uh, in flag football. But he at one time elbowed me in the side of my head and I ended up on the ground, most likely with a concussion. Now they have something called concussion protocol. Let me tell you what concussion protocol looked like back then because this is what I remember. I remember Donnie Kerr grabbing me and going, you okay? You okay? And I said, I think so. He goes, all right, get back up. Get in there. Keep him from coming at me. And I'm like, okay, that was concussion protocol back then. They didn't even ask me how many fingers, to which I would have replied some. So that was concussion protocol. And I remember playing and, and not even really remembering the rest of the game. How many people in here have ever had a concussion? You know that feeling, if you've never had a concussion, what you need to do is take one of those, those things that shakes the paint can and just stick your head in there just for a couple of minutes and then you'll have an idea of what it feels like. It really is like you're in a blender. And here's the deal about that. Listen, when you're going through something in life and all of a sudden you have a radical thing happen, maybe you're confronted with something. Maybe the doctor gives you a report. Maybe all of a sudden the IRS calls and says, it's time for an audit, <laughs> right? And, and maybe one of those things that happens and all of a sudden you're like, what do I do now? And during those times of un uncertainty, we can become filled with fear, frustration, irritation, anger, unforgiveness, all kind of wrong emotions can come in. And so today what I want to do is I want to give you just four ways. And I called them the four B's. And it's not anything, I don't think any of these points you're going to go, that's the most radical thing I've ever heard. But I think for all of us, it's going to be a reminder of what really matters. Because the truth is, if you're at a crossroads today and you don't know what to do, these four things from the Bible will help you. And we're looking today at Mark chapter 11. And here's the deal about Mark chapter 11. This is, Mark has kind of turned the corner in his storytelling. Now remember, he's telling the story, most likely writing it in Rome. He's writing from Peter's experience. Peter is telling him, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Mark is writing down what I like to call the cliff notes versions of all these stories. It's the shortest gospel. He runs through a lot of stories. In Mark chapter 11, the, the disciples are now going into Jerusalem. Jesus said, I'm going there to die. And the disciples all went, oh, okay, um, who's going to be boss? I mean, they're just arguing about stuff. They're not paying attention. Uh, even at the Lord's Supper, they're still arguing about who's going to be in charge. And as they go into all this uncertainty, Jesus has several choices that he makes in this chapter. And I believe each of these choices are also applicable to us today. And the first one being this. Be obedient to his word. 
See, here you have Mark talking to the Romans. And people in Rome would have known about what it looked like for a king to come into town after winning. And so he would have been on a horse or he would have been on some kind of amazing chariot, a gold chariot, coming into town, maybe prisoners behind him, carts full of gold items that they had taken from their, their captives. And then Mark tells this story about Jesus. Think of the contrast it would have been. Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it. By the way, you know what you find in villages, right? Village people. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, by the way, Brian sent me a thing. He said he's got a joke about construction workers, but he's still working on it. They only get worse. Okay, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. That's always a good start, by the way. I mean, you, you, you know, animals don't normally like to be ridden. So getting an animal that's never been ridden is not necessarily a good idea. Like, Candy, when you go to buy a horse, you don't go, give me one that's never been ridden. I want to break that thing in. That'll be awesome. But this is how awesome Jesus is. Listen, no one has ever ridden. He says, untie it and bring it here. And then listen to what he says to them. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and he'll send it back shortly. All right. So, guys, I don't want you to go knock on the door and ask permission. I just want you to go and get that cult. And if anybody asks you, just say, the master asked for it. We'll bring it back soon. We're just going to borrow your burrow. Right? And so, do you like that? Okay. Why are you doing this? The Lord sent it. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people, which are probably the neighbors, like, this is like your neighborhood. They're hanging out in your neighborhood. This is maybe a cul-de-sac, I don't know. And, and they're standing there, and they said, uh, what are you doing untying that colt? <laughs> so they answered, as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. I don't know what's going on in this story, but what Jesus said... Now, some people believe that Jesus lined it up with the people ahead of time. And let me tell you the answer to that. No idea. But he's God, so he knew what needed to be said and what needed to be done, and so that's what he did. They answered, as Jesus told them, when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead of those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, in other passages, it refers back to Zechariah 9. This one refers back to the prophecy in Psalms 118. And so as they're coming into town, the disciples had to basically go and be obedient to a task which would have required some guts. To just walk in. I want you to just walk in and, and take that. And if somebody says something, just say, well, we're borrowing it. We'll bring it right back. And the disciples looked at Jesus and said, okay. This was a turning point, I believe, in their relationship with Jesus. That he said, this is what I want you to do. And they didn't say, well, okay, tell me how this is going to work. Now, I don't know about you, but I like answers when somebody tells me to do something. Years ago, I had a youth pastor. And I don't know if you've ever done a trust fall, but a trust fall is basically where you stand maybe on a chair. And then youth groups did this all the time. Sometimes uh, uh, work groups would do this. And the person would cross their arms over themselves and they would fall backwards. And the idea was for your teammates or your youth group or your coworkers would catch you. Now, I had a youth pastor who was a football player. And that wasn't good enough for him. Now, this will tell you how long ago it was. He would take us to the bus, the church bus. And he wanted the students to stand on the hood of the church bus and fall backwards, which, of course, I as a wimp refused to do. But there were other students who would stand up on that church bus and fall backwards into the arms of the youth. I always thought, you are crazy. I am, that's my life. I am not trusting these students. But over and over, kids would fall back. I never got to the point that I trusted any of those kids enough to do that. I love those kids, but I wasn't going to trust them that way. 
I mean, I mean, you know, I'll let you be by my side, but you're not catching me coming off a bus. The disciples got to the point that when Jesus said, I want you to go and do this, they said, okay, we'll go and do it. And then when they got there, they just did exactly what Jesus said. By the way, that was rare for the disciples, and it's rare for us. But there's a time in life when God calls us to be obedient that we just need to obey. Because too often, as we go through times of uncertainty, we keep saying, what's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And I love what Charles Stanley said. He says, obey God and leave the consequences to him. So instead of always saying, what's next? What's next? What's next? Just say, you know what? I'm going to obey God today. And if today seems too big, then guess what? I'm going to obey God this hour. And if that hour seems too big, I'm going to obey God this moment. Obey God. Leave the consequences to him. Let him work it out. Jesus is looking back at God's word, and when he speaks, he's speaking God's word to them. What is God's word saying to you? When's the last time you read the Bible and didn't just read it as a book, but you allowed God's word to speak to you about your life? about the things that you do, about the way that you think, about forgiveness. Number two, so we are obedient to his rule. Be ready to let him rearrange you. I do not like this point. Can we skip it? If you have spent time in prayer, and it's been weeks since you've had a twinge of the Holy Spirit rearranging you, then it could be that you're not praying right. Imagine if you were on Facebook this afternoon or you were reading an article or maybe you're really old school. You actually have a paper sitting by your lawn when you get up in the morning. I mean, that's some old school stuff right there, right? And you go out and you get the newspaper or you get online and you're reading Facebook and all of a sudden you see an article and you start reading it. And you kind of pick up in the middle and as you read it, you realize this article is describing what you have been thinking about that person you don't like. And they're exact. I mean, they know exactly what you were thinking. I can't believe they wore that. I can't believe that neighbor would park in front of my yard over and over. I can't believe they're so noisy. I can't believe they keep launching fireworks here in Port St. John. I've heard that one over and over, right? By the way, some of you, we don't need to read an article about that. You post it on Facebook every time they light one. I'll get you. What if everything you thought was all of a sudden online where you could read it? This is what Pastor Eric was thinking this morning as he drove to church. <gasps> Even worse, what if you were like those characters in the cartoons where you had a bubble upside your head that right in the middle of church, all of a sudden I could just push a button and that bubble would come up. Did you know teachers today, by the way, teaching can see what students are doing on their screen. If, they, if the kids all have iPads, they have a program now. The teacher can click on any kid's program and find out exactly what they're doing on their iPad at any time. Oh, that doesn't go, always go well. Do you ever get caught throwing a note in school? Well, this was one of those moments where all of a sudden they were discovered. And this is uh, likely the second time that Jesus had actually cleansed the temple. Listen to what happens here. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Now, time out. I want you to, I need to give you a little uh, uh, idea. This was the outer court. This was the Gentile court. Which, by the way, the religious leaders didn't find a whole lot of use for. Because why are we reaching out to those Gentiles? They were ripping people off. They were robbing them, according to Jesus. It wasn't just that they were selling stuff. Number one, they were selling stuff in the wrong place. And number two, they were stopping ministry in a place where they should have been teaching the Gentiles about God. What we would call evangelism now. This was the place where the Jews would say, this is what God has done for us and help others to find their way home to God. But they decided instead we would focus on money. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, so this isn't all he did. He also taught them. He said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is actually referring back to two passages, one in Isaiah 57 and the other one in Jeremiah 7, which is a reminder to the people of God that it's not about 
the money. It's about your heart before God. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill them. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. See, the religious leaders heard this and see, they got a little cut of the money that was being taken in in the temple. They got a little cut of what was going on. They were not only religious leaders, they were political leaders. <clears throat> so their motives were not very pure. And what happened? Jesus came in and said, this isn't right. Now let me ask you this. When was the last time you were driving somewhere? Maybe you were sitting down with your Bible or maybe you were singing a song of praise in the middle of church and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit speaks to you and rearranges your thinking. You know, the way you talked to your child yesterday wasn't very godly. You know, that thought you had about your boss is not exactly spiritual. You know, that person that you refuse to forgive, I want you to Forgive. When's the last time that God rearranged you? And if it's been a while, can I tell you something? It's not that you're getting your act together perfectly. It could be that you haven't spent enough time getting still for God to say, you know, pride has snuck in and has set up a table in your house. You know, fear has come in and set up a table in your house. By the way, in the New Testament, just so you know, we don't call this a sanctuary. Did you know that? You've never heard me call this a sanctuary. You know why? Because in the New Testament, you know where the sanctuary is? Right here. Sanctuary is you. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says that you and I are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Not this place. Your heart. So have you and I allowed other things to sneak in to keep God from doing what he wants to do with us. Have we allowed other things to sneak in that are keeping us from doing the work God has called us to do? There's a Facebook echo in this room. That was weird. Number three, believe with a prayer of faith. You know, if you've been going through life and you have not been praying prayers of faith, it could be that your prayers are starting to feel stale. It could be that you've not stepped out and prayed anything more than what you always pray. Maybe you've gotten so routine in your prayers, you just pray for your friends and you pray for your neighbors and you pray for whatever, or you've forgotten to pray altogether. Jesus, of course, does this whole thing. We hear about the fig tree and there's a lot of theological arguments about what that means and that's not really my point today. And then he basically comes back to the fig tree and he curses it. Not because he was just angry, but because he was making a point about the power of God. Jesus says this, Mark eleven twenty two to 25, have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so your father in heaven may forgive your sins. Two things here. This doesn't mean that you just pray anything you want and it'll happen. It doesn't mean you just today you go, God, I need a million dollars. Thank you so much. I'll see that tomorrow. But it means that when you are walking in God's will in a true attitude of prayer and you're seeking his will, I believe that anything in the power of the spirit that God lays on your heart that God will bring to pass. And so pray that way. Pray in faith. Take a step out of what you normally do and pray a prayer of faith. But you know the second part of that? Nobody likes to talk about the second part. We have to forgive. Is there anyone you haven't forgiven? See, forgiveness is not about saying that what somebody did is okay. Forgiveness is not about saying that that person doesn't deserve punishment. Sometimes you forgive somebody and you call the police. I've had to do that. As a pastor and a youth pastor for years, I've had to be the one. To call the police and say, you need to be aware of this situation. It's horrible. It's tragic. And yet you can forgive somebody who does the unimaginable. It doesn't mean you say it's okay. It doesn't mean you have to hang around them. It doesn't mean you have to allow them to hurt you again. It doesn't mean that you have to say, oh, I think it's great what they did. God used it to bless me. It just means that you say, God... I choose to forgive them because you forgave me. 
Now, let me tell you what a prayer of faith is like. I've been working out on the elliptical. I don't know if you know much about an elliptical, but the arms and the legs move. You just kind of do this. So I've been working out on the same elliptical for months, and it kind of looks like this. This is about right. It's about my speed. I watch the news. I do whatever. You know, I'm listening to the radio. I'm just blah, blah, blah. So this week, I did something ridiculously dumb. I decided, you know what? That workout's getting a little boring. I'm going to look up one of these YouTube videos. Now, I did not pre-watch it. I just typed in elliptical workout video 20 minutes. I wasn't going to do 30, 20. So I punched it in. I thought, how bad can this be? <laughs> bad. This guy, got, we did a warm-up with this guy, and, and, and he did the warm-up, and then all of a sudden he says, okay, 30 seconds, as hard as you can go. Now, you got to realize, I take on a challenge. I'm like, hard as I can go? Okay, I can do that. And all of a sudden, I'm, <laughs> I mean, this thing's squeaking. It's, yeah, my, the elliptical is yelling for help. It's calling neighbors, please get him off of me. The man's too heavy. I'm going as fast as I can. Listen, first 30 seconds. I think I'm going to die. He's like, you're not going to die. But make sure you check your heart before you do this workout. You know, I did the whole disclaimer. In the middle, it's a bad time to start. Six more times. Six more times we take a rest and then go again. Guess what? I was sore. I'm still sore. Three days ago. I'm still, I'm, I'm, the older you get, the sore you are. Now I get out of bed, I make noise. Oh, what happened? I worked out. What happened? I did a real workout. Why? Because I did a workout with somebody who challenged me. Listen, if your prayers are no longer challenging you, maybe you need to start asking God, God, would you help me? Would you give me a prayer of faith? Maybe for a person that you can pray for? Maybe for a situation that you can pray for? Maybe for one of your children or grandchildren? Maybe, maybe for a cousin? God, show me how to pray for them. And God, I'm going to trust you to do what you said you would do. What only you can do. And sometimes, by the way, that's a little scary. Especially when you step out, when you start saying, God, help me to know what you want me to do and then do it. Boy, you talk about a prayer of faith. This morning, right now, one of our guys who's been here at church was asked to speak at another church for the next couple of weeks. Rodney, of course, we know, has been asked to be an interim at a church here in Brevard County. It's amazing when you start to say, God, what do you want me to do? How God goes, oh, I'll show you. Now, can I tell you as a pastor, I don't like it because I need people here, right? But I love it. Because our goal is not to be a country club and just get a bunch of people coming here. Our goal is to be a missionary organization where we send people out to change the world. Everything you do every week should be that prayer of faith. God, help me to do what you want me to do to change the world. Life is a temporary assignment. Number four. So we're obedient to his word. We're ready to let him rearrange us. We believe with a prayer of faith. And then finally, last but not least, bow to his authority. See, the religious leaders had begun to bow to Roman authority. Although they said they wanted a Messiah, they wanted a Messiah to do what they wanted them to do, relieve taxes. That was their main goal. Let's get the Romans out of here because they're taxing us to death. We, we, you know, we don't, mind the, we don't mind that they built us a new temple. We, we don't mind that they have brought water to town. We don't mind that they've done all these things. But we don't want to stand up against them. So when they killed John the Baptist, the religious leaders of the time remained silent. Well, Jesus didn't forget that. That was his cousin. Peter didn't forget that story. And as he's writing to the Romans, he goes ahead and points out what happened. It says, they arrived again in Jerusalem. While Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him by saying, by what authority do you do these things? You know, you're teaching, you're, you're, you're kicking out our income. What, what authority are you using? And who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I'll ask you one question. Answer me and I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. John's baptism. Remember, this book of the Bible started out with John, right? Was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he'll ask, then why didn't you believe him? If we say of human origin, and then it goes on. Why? Because they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, 
Uh, we don't know. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. See, we have a choice every day with whose authority we're going to bow to. And if we're honest, too often we bow to the authority of comfort and convenience for us. What's easy for me? What's the most comfortable thing for me? And if we're honest, we're not bowing to the authority of Scripture or bowing to the authority of God. We're bowing to our own personal pleasures, our own desires, the way we want to do things. When somebody says something to us we don't like, we respond, how dare you not bow to me? And instead, we need to say, God, I choose to bow to your authority in the middle of strife and struggle and uncertainty. By the way, nobody likes uncertainty. We hate waiting. I mean, doctor's offices have three waiting rooms, right? You go in, you sit in the waiting room. Then they take you back and weigh you and put you in another room. And then after they put you in that room, they put you in a third room. And you're waiting for the whole time. You're like, I don't like waiting. I want to just go in and get my stuff done. How dare that doctor not bow to me? When's the last time the cable repairman told you, I'll be there between the hours of 8 and 7 o'clock tomorrow night, right? How dare they? And we look at people and we go, how dare they not honor me? I mean, this left lane is mine. How dare you go 50 miles an hour in this left lane? You never do that, right? How dare you not? So what in your life have you been bowing to? Is it entertainment? Is it convenience? On September 11th, I can't believe we celebrated that or honored that 19 years ago is when it happened. See, the terrorists thought they would come and if they blew up enough stuff that we would say, we're going to bow to your authority. We're going we're gonna to not, uh, we're going to let you guys do whatever you want. You can have jihad everywhere. Just, just whatever you want to do, just leave us alone. And what they didn't know is the very opposite thing happened. All of a sudden, Americans became united and said, we will not bow to that. Listen. In your own life, have you gotten tired of bowing to the wrong thing? Have you gotten tired of allowing the enemy to allow you to bow to whatever the pleasure and desire and the selfishness and all the things that occupy our thoughts and minds? And have you said, God, I don't want to bow to the secular nature of the world and humanism and all the things the world thinks is important? Father, I want to bow to whatever you think is important. And if you tell me today to go and get an unridden cult for you, just tell me what to do when I get there. My dad used to say it this way. He said, boy, my dad called me boy. It's always a good start. He said, when I say jump, you say how high on the way up. How do you do that? What he was trying to say to me is you do what I say when I tell you to do it. No question. Just go do it. Now with my dad, can I tell you that was not good. <laughs> But when God says, trust me, can you do it? When God says, wait on me, can you do it? When God says, forgive, can we do it? If you're here today and you're facing a time of uncertainty, you're at that crossroads, I want to encourage you. Ask God to work in your life. Ask God to help you to be obedient to his word as you spend time in it. Ask God to rearrange your heart from the selfishness and self-centeredness. Believe with a prayer of faith and then finally bow to his authority. The Christian life is all about surrender. You can allow uncertainty to push you towards God. Or you can allow uncertainty to push you towards all anger, frustration, irritation. My prayer for you is that it would lead you towards God. If you're watching online or you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, the first Step to bowing to his authority is what we call surrender. Jesus, I know you died on a cross for me. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm broken. I surrender my life to you. Please take my sins. The Bible says that when we do that and we surrender to him, the great exchange takes place. When we say, Jesus, I want to make you Lord, that basically means boss. The Bible says that he takes our sins, puts them on the cross, and gives us his righteousness. When you do that, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. That's why when you're driving somewhere or you're in your quiet time, the Holy Spirit can say to you, it's time to rearrange that area. 
So if you want to give your life to Christ today, I'd be glad to talk to you after the service, or if you're watching online, you can send me a note. I'd also encourage you, if during the message at some time today, something, God put something on your heart, hey, don't leave it there. Begin praying that prayer of faith. And maybe for you, it's just a matter of, God, would you increase my faith? Let's pray today. Father, thank you for your word and your power. Thank you for these moments. Thank you for each one watching online and each one here. Father, those who will be watching later this week, I pray that your word, you said it would never go out and not have fruit. So, Lord, I pray that you'd produce fruit from this word today. Lord, change our hearts and our minds. Help us not to leave it here. We choose to bow to your authority today. We ask you to change us, to rearrange us. In Jesus' name, amen.